because many mm-hmm. times Myanmar military elites have tried to compare the situation in uh, former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia uh, with the crisis in Myanmar, like the balkanization of of mm-hmm. Myanmar, because well, Myanmar has uh, a deeply divided society with long-standing civil war, and uh, the topic about federalism is quite crucial for state building project in Myanmar. Uh, uh, not so different from uh, former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. Uh, political adversary also talk about federalism as well. But Myanmar military tried to connect or draw a connection between federalism and secessionist politics. Mm-hmm. Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and today I've got the great pleasure of talking to a colleague in Thailand. I've got with me Dr. Dulia Pak Prechalat, uh, who is an Associate Professor of Asian Studies at the Faculty of Liberal Arts and the Deputy Director of the Institute of East Asian Studies at Thammasat University in Bangkok. And actually, I don't want to talk to him about Thailand, um, but about its immediate neighbor, Myanmar, because Dr. Prechalat is a great expert on the politics and the are of uh, of Myanmar and also of its armed conflict there. He recently wrote the book, The Politics of Federalization in Myanmar, and has been keeping a very close eye on everything that happened after the country's turn toward democracy after 2011, and then again away from that path after the military coup in 2021. Uh, since when the country has now been engulfed in ever ever more fighting and and ever more civil war. So, Dr. Prechalat, welcome and thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you so much for your kind invitation. Um, I was looking forward to this talk a lot because, you know, Myanmar is a bit of a black box. And it's really difficult to find people who have studied the political process of a, a, of a long time. And you are right next to it in, in, in Bangkok. It's like it's, it's very close to go. And, and you've been observing what has been happening. For everybody who's not on speed with Myanmar internal politics, could you maybe tell us um, what the state of the civil war is today? Where does it come from? I mean, 2021, but also before that. I mean, there was civil strife all the way uh, all along. Where does that come from? And where are we at the moment as we speak in uh, 2024 with the different forces on the ground? I think the current civil war in Myanmar comes from the coup by senior General Minong Ran three years ago. Uh, I think first of all, we need to understand the formation of the hybrid political regime in Myanmar. So in 2011, there was the President Teng Sen governed the state of Myanmar under hybrid political regime in which democratic elements and authoritarian elements coexist and operate together. And the duration of this kind of hybrid political regime depends on civil military relations. Okay, the military need to keep balance with civilian government. But when Aung San Suu Kyi took power and established NLD government, it seems that the civil military relation has some problems. The NLD government wanted to amend the 2008 constitution by reducing the military power in politics. So the military decided to uh, take control of the state, capture Aung San Suu Kyi and democratic leader, paving the way for the military or totalitarian politics in Myanmar after the coup. But the unexpected outcome is the widespread political uprising against Myanmar military regime. So that is the emergence of the civil war in Myanmar. And I think nowadays, if we talk about the civil war in Myanmar in terms of political structure, I think the power base can be classified into three groups. The first one is military government led by senior General Min Aung Lai. The second one uh, uh, is the NUG government or opposition group aiming to eradicate the military from politics and establish democratic federation for Myanmar. And the last one, very interesting, ethnic minority armed organizations, which can be subdivided, according to my perspective, into three main groups. The first groups still maintain relations with senior General Minolai, 
for peace talk. The second group decide has decided to cooperate with NUG government in order to fight with Myanmar military. And the last group uh, is ethnic armies that have decided to stay neutral. Let's make the principle of neutrality, not sliding to mean or lie or sliding to opposition group. So the political structure is quite complicated after the group. And Myanmar is a big country. Uh, there are how many million people? Uh, according to the census, it is around 55, uh, uh, 54 to 55 million. Okay, uh, but uh, in but in reality, I I, I, I think there are uh, many people both in the heartland and the frontier area. So we're talking about maybe roughly sixty million or so in a very in a very delicate like a political structure. Where of course a lot of people are centered in the in the big metropolis, but about how many people are outside of the direct uh, power of the well. Of the military government because that's the one with the big weapons right that's the most powerful one how many how many percent are under military government rule uh according to my estimation it is rather difficult for me to identify uh, the the uh the, the percentage mm -hmm. uh, for, for 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 the population in myanmar in each group but let me say that myanmar consists of majority and minority groups for the majority, mostly it's about the Burman people, okay, which uh, take around sixty percent for the whole population, and the remaining forty percent is ethnic minority people, such as the Chan, the Kachin, the Kaya, the Arakanese people, and these people can be subdivided into several subgroups as well. And for talking about the the manpower of Myanmar military, it is around uh, forty. Uh, 400,000 manpower, okay? And uh, for the opposition group, oh, okay, uh, the number of manpower cannot compare with Myanmar military, but for the current situation, the Myanmar manpower uh, has been decreases uh, due to uh, the, the continuity of the victory by opposition group. So Myanmar military is still in the difficult situation for the civil war, uh, but we need to wait and see whether Myanmar military can change the political situation by gaining the upper hand for military strategy in order to counter attack or subjugate opposition group. Yeah, but the problem that they have from their view is that the opposition is like distributed all over the place in Myanmar, right? And there's not one single front. There's many, many fronts. And you just even 400,000 is not really enough to keep a lid on all of that, right? So and that's something that we haven't seen before. But there was a military dictatorship before 2011, but it operated in a completely different environment. Could you maybe describe the difference between today's uh, military dictatorship and, and how like the, the opposition groups and back then before 2011? I personally, I noticed the big progress for opposition group in Myanmar before the coup by Minh Nong Lai. Uh, for talking about opposition group, we, we focus on democratizing process the power of democratization, but for viewing political movement by ethnic minority armed forces, we focus on federalization or federating process. But since the coup by Minh Aung Lai, uh, we can see the convergence or the combination between the power of democratization and the power of federalization. Because NUG government want to establish federal democracy or democratic federation. And this political campaign can invite some ethnic minority group who want to see federalism in Myanmar to join the political process against the ruling junta. So I think this kind of situation is quite different from the past because now the Tatmadaw has confronted with the powerful opposition group with the combination of federalization and democratization. And the political structure in Myanmar, especially in terms of political geography, is more complicated comparing to the past. Nowadays, uh, around three years since Minh Nong Lai took power until today, I think the geo body of Myanmar 
politics can be classified into two main parts. The first part is the frontier area, the borderline between Myanmar, China, Myanmar, Thailand, Myanmar, and India. Nowadays, we see a lot of liberated zone dominated by NUG government. We see a lot of uh, like the, the, the autonomous area dominated by ethnic minority groups. This kind of political geographical structure can encircle the Burman heartland, which is the seat of power of the Tatmadaw in Nepidaw. So uh, the Tatmadaw is, has been encircled mm. by opposition group and ethnic armed um, organization and encircled by the huge topography from the frontier to the Burman heartland. So the interesting question is how the Tatmadaw can break down the encirclement by opposition group. It is one of the most challenging issues for the Tatmadaw. The Tatmadaw is the military junta, right? It's, yes, it's really, exactly. Yeah. And uh, just for to be clear on the terminology, uh, how about the cities? There is, there is, uh, there is. Okay, Nipido, the new new capital that was kind of artificially created, that is still capital. We have uh, Yangon, the the uh, kind of economic center. We have Mandalay, an old like and very important imperial capital, right? How how is the how's the political situation in these big places where a lot of people gather, right, and where where uprisings could happen? That that is very good question. I think Nepido is the seat of power of Myanmar Armed Forces and is the island fortification created by senior General Tan Chui several years ago. Uh, Nepido is the safe zone for uh, public administration by military government. Uh, and for Yangkung is the commercial capital. But after the coup, there have been uh, terrorist attacks in some strategic areas of Yangkung. And Mandalay, uh, is another important commercial town situated in the dry zone of Myanmar and linking strategic road from China to India. Uh, the Chinese sphere of influence uh, is very clear in Mandalay be because uh, there, there, there are a logistical transportation network linking Mandalay with uh, Sino-Myanmar borderland as well as Kunming in China. Okay, uh, but, but I think in order to develop a systematic framework for viewing political structure in Myanmar. I think uh, we can look at Myanmar political geography and classify it into sub-regions, okay? And according to my perspective, I think there are many battlefields uh, that the body of knowledge about regional geography or area study can be beneficial in one way or another. For example, if we take a look at the battlefield in the dry zone of Myanmar, uh, this is a very, very important area because turning back to the long historical process, whenever the Burmese or Burman monarchical institution decided to, to, uh, to have the power projection and expand its military power, it is, uh, it is needed for them to consolidate many principalities across the dry zone area. And after that, the dry zone can incorporate the delta area and the frontier area. As the result, the Burmese armed forces can uh, attack the Siamese kingdom at Ayutthaya, many principalities along Sino Myanmar borderland or Manipur in northeastern India. Uh, nowadays, the, the dry zone is in a, a difficult situation because the, op the opposition group want to command and control some strategic areas throughout the dry zone. But Myanmar military dissatisfied about this. And one of the heartland for fighting is Chewebo. Chewebo is situated in the northeastern direction from Mandalay. This is the hometown of Ching Along Paya, one of the most powerful uh, Burman monarchs in the past. And Myanmar military uh, has never wanted to surrender the opposition group in uh, Chowebo district. So they, they, they fight very well. And nowadays, the opposition group cannot capture the town. So if we look at the dry zone, the dry zone can be subdivided into Chowebo district. 
in Tutong U, in the Sitong Valley, in Nepido, or in Michila, or even Mandalay, also situated in, uh, the, in the dry zone. But the geography of Myanmar is more complicated because we can take a look at southeastern Myanmar, consisting of Kajin State, Kaya State, Mon State, and Tajin Nagi Legion. We can take a look at the Chan State. After uh, the, uh, the operation of the Brotherhood Alliance last year in the Northern Chan State, the situation is very complicated. Uh, and uh, we also uh, have the Southwestern Myanmar composing Arakanist State with the Arakan Army and the Rohingya community. So I think the knowledge about regional geography might be helpful in some way for viewing civil war in Myanmar. Yeah, and when you talk about the dry land or dry area, then that would be all of the big north northeastern part, right? That is basically adjacent to to Thailand, right? That that that's um, the important one. Yeah, I, I I think geographically, dry zone is situated in the central position in Myanmar, a little bit far away from from the Thai frontier, and. Um, the, the important cities are Mandalay, Tong U, Nepidor, Mithila, Chowebo, Moniwa, and so on and so forth. Uh, Yangkong is situated in the delta of Ayawadi River, okay? And, uh, and uh, for, the, for the frontier area, there are Chan State, uh, which share geographical proximity with northern part of Thailand, especially Chiang Mai, Chiang Lai, Mang Hong Son. We share the cross border with southern Chan State. But for the western uh, part of Thailand, we share the border with Kajin State, Kaya State, Mon State, and Myanmar, Kajin Nagi region. And it, is the fighting in that area increasing? Because so I two months ago, three months ago, I was in Chiang Rai and Chiang Mai, and I also met a, a colleague who's working as a doctor in, an, in, a, in a hospital, and he recently told me that he's seeing more people with uh, traumatic injuries from Myanmar. So in the, the border area seems to be getting more fighting at the moment and so does is that fighting like of the of the military junta against these uh, against these local insurgencies or um what is happening at the moment there that that is a good question uh, the fighting has been increasing along thai myanmar borderland and but uh, it, it is not only the fighting between Myanmar military and opposition groups with some ethnic minority armed organizations, but it also the fighting among some ethnic minority armed organizations in some particular area. For example, in the southern part of Chan State, uh, we can see uh, the, uh, the, uh, the increasing mili military power of UWSA or uh, or, or the late war ethnic group, uh, which is very famous for drug trafficking and for their close relation with China. And there are increasing military uh, camps, garrisons, and manpower of UWSA along Thai Myanmar borderland. And UWSA has some strategic conflict with RCSS and other ethnic armed organizations uh, with its headquarters very close to the Thai border. And, and Another example is the crash between the Red Bo and the White Bo. Despite the fact that uh, they share the same ethnic identity, the Bo, but with different ideologies, the White Bo has both Tatmadaw or Myanmar armed forces policy, while the Red Bo has a very close connection with China and UWSA, and and they have fought together. Uh, so the uh, the uh, the political adversaries in conflict and confrontation in Myanmar long-standing civil war is quite uh, complicated. Yeah, very complicated. And uh, th this leads me to my next question, because, you know, traditionally in international relations, whenever a very complicated civil war like that happens, it's also basically a huge opportunity for outside forces to intervene. And so on the one hand, uh, Myanmar has been has been put on pause in ASEAN, right? It's 
its seat is empty at the moment. This, the Organization of Southeast Asian is uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations is not. I mean, they they don't recognize the military junta, so Myanmar is not represented, and they try to put pressure on them. At the same time, they still try to have a diplomatic uh, process with them, even inviting the junta to to uh, uh, Indonesia in order to have some sort of talks, right? And and from my friend in in. Uh, in Chiang Mai, I know, and I haven't verified this, but he said that the U.S. consulate in Chiang Mai is humongous and is obviously also used in order to manage U.S., I mean, to have U.S. influence in Myanmar. And China is, is, is right there as well. Could you maybe lay out the different international actors and if who are they supporting? Who, who, what's the U.S. doing and U.S. foreign policy in Myanmar and China uh, policy in Myanmar? Do you know anything about that? Uh, yes, this this question is so interesting and fits with my uh, academic interest. Uh, for for the Chinese government, they want to command and control Myanmar because uh, the Chinese investor uh, uh, have a lot of uh, benefits in Myanmar. Uh, let's take a look at. Bell and Road Initiative, uh, the, the, the framework, the logistical framework for Bell and Road Initiative partly uh, 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 touch the land of Myanmar. And it is very important for uh, the Chinese government and business sector to keep the connection from Sino-Myanmar borderland to Mandalay and then to the Chinese deep sea port in Rakhai or Arakaniste. Uh, so, uh, the main lesson for China to maintain a friendly relations with many stakeholders in Myanmar because they want to command and control the strategic shortcut in Myanmar in order to access to uh, the Bay of Bengkong and the Andaman Sea, which is the part of the Indian Ocean, by not traveling through the Strait of Malacca and by stimulating the, the economic condition in the hinterland, especially southwestern China. And nowadays, China can, can uh, conduct the power projection to Myanmar peace process because ethnic armed organizations along Sino-Myanmar borderlands such as UWSA, TNLA, MNDAA, all of this more or less have some connection with China. And uh, the Tatmadaw of uh, Myanmar Armed Forces uh, feel very concerned about the increasing Chinese sphere of influence in Chan State and in other parts of Myanmar. Uh, for American foreign policy, I think uh, before political transition in Myanmar, uh, especially under Teng Sen administration, uh, the, the American foreign policy focused only on sanction. But, well, but when Myanmar transit into a more democratizing process. The U.S. decided to engage more with the new regime in Myanmar. So uh, the pattern of American foreign policy has been changed significantly. And another one is in order to counterbalance with uh, the strong Chinese sphere of influence, the U.S. should take more action. But the U.S. The US is not acting alone because it has already proclaimed the Indo-Pacific outlook by incorporating Japan, Australia, and India into this kind of framework. So uh, the U.S. is not acting alone, but it, it, it might invite India and Japan to cooperate with each other in order to uh, develop peace and democratic institution in Myanmar post coup politics and in order to cultivate with the Chinese sphere of influence. But so we... Uh, we don't have any kind of concrete information about um, any kind of activities, clandestine activities of U.S. or Chinese with with the different stakeholders. Is that still very much a black box? I mean, we don't know who supports whom exactly. But what you're saying is that China supports a lot of them and has a, lot, a big interest actually in stability, right? Yes, yes. Uh, but But I think that there might be some evidence because uh, for, for the fighting combat between NUG government opposition group with some ethnic minority armed organizations, the weapon that uh, was captured by Myanmar military notified uh, the Chinese alphabet, meaning that some weapon come from Sino-Myanmar borderland, okay? And uh, the, 
And but the Chinese government is very clever because uh, they don't want to maintain strategic relations with ethnic um, armies alone, but they also share some benefits with Myanmar armed forces as well. So they command and control many political stakeholders in Myanmar politics and society. Uh, for the role of the American power, I think one of the most obvious examples is about the support for democratic development in Myanmar. We can see the, uh, the, the power of the U.S. in uh, this category. Uh, for, for example, in, in Kachin State, a Kachin independent organization would like to develop democratic institution from the local village. Okay, and it is very important to, to say something about good governance, about election, about democratic development, and non-profit organization having connection with the U.S. and the Western world come to help the Kachin people, the Kachin civil society for developing democracy. So, so there are some evidence. The, the, this is where I get where I always get a little bit suspicious because the United States has a track record of helping democratic institutions whenever they align with their with their uh, uh, goals. And when they don't, then the U.S. has no problem of supporting people like Al Sisi in Egypt or uh, a coup against uh, the Pakistan's leader uh, last year. Uh, um, Imra Khan, right? There's no problem when I mean autocracy helps sometimes. So I, I I wonder where the power political game is at the moment. Um, but the the junta is very much isolated, right? The nobody is officially supporting them, I suppose. Um, I think there are there are three interesting major powers that uh, have supported the junta in Myanmar. The first one is China, but as I said earlier that China don't want to support uh, the junta alone, but also support uh, opposition group and some ethnic armed organizations. And the second one is Russia, because Russia is the big uh, weapon supplier for Myanmar armed forces, okay? And the last one is North Korea, okay? Mm. So uh, let me turn back to uh, the the Tang Chui administration before Myanmar political transition in 2011. At that time, Myanmar was condemned by American foreign policy makers okay, as a party of state, as the state with human rights violation with the long-standing military authoritarianism. And at that time, George W. Bush decided to invade Iraq and Afghanistan, try to uh, destroy the Saddam regime and Taliban regime. So Tan Chui regime was in a difficult and unstable situation. So the military regime, military leaders at that time decided to move the capital from Yangon to Nepidor and build a strong military fortification system in the mountainous area for running uh, the tunnel warfare and the guerrilla warfare there uh, because they imagine that once they, the American armed forces with the support by United Nations might invade Myanmar in order to eradicate Myanmar military. So they try to increase strategic relations with Russia and North Korea. They decided to receive ballistic missile program from North Korea. They decided to study tunnel warfare, study underground complex by having Russian and North Korean model. So I, I can confirm that North Korea and Russia can support Myanmar military in one way or another. That is highly interesting. So the you know, it also it's horrible. Any kind of civil war, any kind of warfare is absolutely horrible. But it's it's of course an, a very extreme case of power politics, and we see all of that playing out. Um, one more thing that I think might also play into this is Myanmar had a, interestingly a very a quite short period of colonization, right? Only about eighteen eighty five, eighty eight until 1946 47 right uh, Sing, uh thailand was never colonized but myanmar was little colonized so how much of the the current 
problems do go back to even older problems, you know, 100 years or 150, 100, 200 year old problems in, in Myanmar at the moment uh, of the of the power politics on the ground? Oh, it's, it's quite interesting to compare Myanmar and Thailand by using historical background mm. and you have uh, noticed about British colonialism in Myanmar, I, I think can 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 offer some some answers. Uh, let me say that Myanmar was colonized by British imperialism. Uh, but after gaining independence from Britain in early 1948, the basic principle of Myanmar foreign policy is neutrality, mm. non-alignment, and active and independent foreign policies. And another one, very interesting, anti-colonialist project, because they see, uh, they, they perceive that the American power in Cold War politics represents the neo-colonialism, very similar to the British power when they uh, colonized Myanmar in the past. So the element of Myanmar foreign policy dominated by Myanmar military, or we can call Praetorian diplomacy, signify uh, the respect for the principle of non-intervention in internal affairs, as well as how to defend the attack by neo-colonialist power. So Myanmar military is quite xenophobia. They, they feel very uh, concerned about foreign intervention, especially from the Western world. So that's why the British colonial legacy still remain in their strategic mindset in foreign affairs. That, that, that kind of situation is quite different from Thailand because the memory of Thailand under uh, the Siamese kingdom under British and French colonialism constitute another narrative that is how the clever how the clever King Churalongkorn can defend the country <laughs> and and uh, uh, and uh, how the pattern of Thai foreign policy uh, decide to stick on the concept of balancing of power or the balancing foreign policy by avoiding uh, one particular uh, external power to dominate uh, the, the Thai foreign affair as a whole. So King Lama the fourth, King Lama the uh, fifth, try to keep in touch with uh, several Western powers, Western kingdom in order to maintain the balancing foreign policy. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, foreign policy legacy during the Siamese kingdom, kingdom under uh, 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 colonialist protection uh, can constitute uh, another answer which quite different from the memory from the case of Myanmar. That's very interesting. And do you think that the that this xenophobic mindset in terms of like keeping the state on the local rule, does that also extend to the rebel groups? Do they also rather think we fight this ourselves or is the perception among the rebel groups a different one when it comes to like uh, interaction with foreign powers? Uh, yes, uh, firstly for Myanmar military, they are very afraid about foreign intervention in domestic politics. Mm. Uh, they, they feel very concerned about American power in Cold War politics, as well as uh, the Western countries to criticize about the junta, criticize about uh, 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 the, the military authoritarianism in Myanmar. Okay, uh, but but for for opposition group such as NUG government, which is another important stakeholder in Myanmar post-group politics. I, I think that foreign policy uh, has aligned to the Western world, to the US, mm -hmm. as their political agenda aimed to eradicate military from politics and establish federalism and uh, a highly decentralized democratic institution. So the US and some Western world are the good model for their foreign policy orientation and their political imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, but for ethnic armed organizations, the, the, the situation is, is quite unique uh, because uh, some ethnic armed groups need to cooperate with external power. Otherwise, they have uh, not sufficient power to fight back with 
เมียนมา military or negotiate with Myanmar military for example the UWSA or the Red w a r they need to acquire uh, modern weapons from China and they they don't fear about Chinese cultural protection because uh, they want only money they want only modern weapon from China and moving back to the Cold War politics the w a r ethnic people. Used to be under the strong power base, dominated by Burma Communist Party, which was supported by Chinese Communist Party, and the current political system among the Wa ethnic group is communist or t o t a l i t a r i a n i m very similar to the Chinese case. Uh, so for UWSA, they want they want China to increase their bargaining power, uh, but for Uh, RCSS or r e s o l u t i o n Council of c h a n State, which has the headquarter across uh, to Thai Myanmar borderland, and the leader, his name is Chao y o s u k and Chao y o s u k is very special because uh, he would like to attain uh, friendly relations with Thailand with the Thai government because he want the Thai government and the Thai military to to back up. His armed forces along the borderline. Uh, so and and uh, the language of communication between the Thai people and the Thai people in Thailand can be understood, can be understood. So so uh, it is not not so difficult for RCSS to communicate with Thailand to establish a warmly relation with uh, the Thai security sector along the borderline. Now you're an expert of federalization, and uh, federalization can be and often is a solution to internal uh, political violence. But it can also be the slippery slope to uh, to to independence of different states. And and Myanmar might break apart. I mean, we've we've heard some of these ethnic groups talking uh, uh, about seceding. From Myanmar, do you think that the Myanmar as a state is at, might break up within like the next couple of months or years? Is there a real danger of that? Uh, I think it is quite dangerous for for the collapse of the state of Myanmar uh, from now on. But 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 I think it it cannot happen very soon because the Burma heartland, uh, which is the backbone of the state of Myanmar. Uh, geopolitically, uh, 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 has still been under the domination of Myanmar armed forces or the Tatmadaw, and the power protection of opposition group and ethnic armed organization often come from the frontier area, come from the borderline. Uh, so, in order to 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 separate. The state as a whole, or you you can see the collapse of the Union of Myanmar look like the collapse of the former Soviet Union or Yugoslavia. It is difficult to to occur uh, in in the upcoming events, but it doesn't mean that uh, the experience from former Yugoslavia and former Soviet Union uh, has no impact on uh, Myanmar military mindset because many mm. times Myanmar military elites. Have tried to compare the situation in uh, former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia uh, with the crisis in Myanmar, like the b o n d a n i z a t i o n of of mm. Myanmar, because uh, Myanmar has uh, a deeply divided society with long-standing civil war, and uh, the topic about federalism is quite crucial for state building project. In Myanmar, uh, uh, not so different from uh, former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, uh, political adversary also talk about federalism as well. But Myanmar military try to connect or draw a connection between federalism and secessionist politics, mm -hmm. and they uh, they said many times, according to my observation, they said that. Look at the case of the former Soviet Union. Okay, uh, if the center is too weak and talk a lot about uh, political freedom, about federalization uh, with the land dominated by uh, ethnic armed forces with nationalist politics, it is dangerous for the collapse of the state. So, in order to avoid the situation like. Uh, former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia just listen to Myanmar military 
and Myanmar military has designed the appropriate political formula that is uh, the combination between some federal elements with some authoritarian and unitarian elements. They want to combine it harmoniously, but the opposition group said that, oh, that, that, that is not a very good idea, not a very clever idea, because we want to see uh, the full degree of federalization and democratization. So we need to revolve against the state and eradicate Myanmar military from politics. We need to write the new constitution in order to respect the principle of civilian supremacy over the military, and we need to establish democratic federation. So opposition group, NUG government, want the, the highly uh, degree, uh, the, the high degree of federalization, but Myanmar military want some degree mm -hmm. of federalization with unitarianism. It's, it's, it's very interesting. The people who tell you that, I think they took the wrong lesson from the Soviet experience because yeah. the Soviet experience, it was Russia that decided to like it was russian nationalism that that tore the soviet union apart it was gorbat it was it wasn't gorbachev it was boris yeltsin who this who was riding on a wave of russian nationalism it's a little bit like if the burmese if the junta decided to take burma out of of myanmar and and let the, and let the rest go but the problem for them is different isn't it because i have burmese friends here in tokyo and they all tell me they're absolutely heartbroken they hate what the military junta is doing it's not burmese versus the others it is even within the burmese uh, community there's a lot of opposition to the to the military junta isn't it yes exactly exactly uh, myanmar military perceive its own people uh, as the enemy of the state mm. uh, whenever people decide to oppose Myanmar military, it means to oppose the state security mm -hmm. system as well. And Myanmar military shall have the political legitimacy to suppress the opposition group or the people that revolt against the military uh, and uh, revolt against the state. Uh, so the perception of Myanmar military is quite conservative. And uh, it is very normal to, to see your colleagues and many uh, Myanmar people dissatisfy about uh, the, the Myanmar uh, perception of trace be because it will uh, the people in uh, as the enemy of the state. Okay, uh, but 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 I think uh, let me share one idea academically. I think uh, the Myanmar military uh, has the politicized Petrolian war fighter with a lot of skill in state building project. Uh, if we recall Chan Tilly proposal about the causal relationship between wall making and state making, mm -hmm. wall making produce state building project, we can uh, adapt and adopt uh, this proposal to consider the current situation in Myanmar because uh, uh, the origin of the Tatmadaw or Myanmar armed forces emerged and developed during the Second World War when the Japanese armed forces came to Myanmar. And uh, because of the power of the Japanese military, uh, the Myanmar armed force was stronger and can uh, 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 fight back with the British colonizer. And uh, uh, the origin of Myanmar armed forces emerged during the warring period, the Second World War. And after gaining independence, Myanmar confronted with the civil war and it is only the Myanmar military that take control of the state, uh, establish the order for the state and suppress opposition groups. So uh, they are the they are uh, the expert for war fighting. Mm. And because of warfare, they can establish military state structure from the central plain in Myanmar to the highland or the mountainous area in which ethnic minority group inhabited largely. So uh, the war fighting, uh, the war building, uh, 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 the war brought about state formation process in which Myanmar military play a leadership role. Uh, 
So Myanmar military uh, has familiarity with war fighting because yeah. war fighting has a connection with state formation process. That's a that's a good observation. But the one thing that's on my mind that I don't that that still doesn't really make sense to me is that this backsliding like in 2011 there was this huge process right of of democratization and opening and and actually Aung San Suu Kyi being being allowed to run for office and then she won huge but half of parliament was still reserved for the military and there was this power sharing that you described and that worked for 10 years and during these 10 years there was massive investments in Myanmar from Japan from other countries like foreign direct investment and Myanmar was thriving and we have huge groups of, of of Burmese and Myanmari students like going out and benefiting from all of these uh, 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 scholarships everywhere and all of that stopped in 2021 and it's really economically a very dark time right now and why did the military junta decide to rather do that when when the 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 alternative was not necessarily to give much more power to the others it was to let to let the current path continue of 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 power sharing inside Myanmar is the junta currently better off economically than before my my burmese friend here told me that it's like they they can make more money even though everybody else is 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 worse off and that's their primary motivation rent seeking is that the case or was this a miscalculation basically from the from the junta Yes, I think it is a miscalculation from the junta. Uh, uh, we we can move back to the formation of hybrid political regime in 2011, in which uh, democratic elements can coexist with authoritarian elements, and uh, the the stability the stability of this regime depends on uh, the balancing behavior between civilian government and the Myanmar military. But when Aung San Suu Kyi took power and established the democratic government, uh, this, uh, this kind of civilian government uh, want many times to reduce the military power in politics by amending the 2008 constitution. So it was shocked by Myanmar generals that uh, democratic movement move forward very fast. <laughs> so mm -hmm. in order to maintain authoritarianism, in order to maintain the disciplined democracy, that is the hybrid political regime in which the military still play the leadership role in politics. It is rather important for Min Nong Lai to to, to take power and get rid of the rising power of civilian governments. Um, but it is the mid-calculation from Min Ong Lai perspective because when Myanmar military decided to stay the coup, uh, they often turn back to, to uh, the coup delta in the past. For example, uh, the coup by General Nevin in 1962, the coup by General Somong in 1988. After the coup, there was very little popular uprising against uh, the coup delta. Uh, but today, but uh, three years ago in 2021, shortly after the coup, there was the widespread of political uprising against uh, senior uh, General Min Ong Lai. And I, as I said earlier, the combination of democratization and federalization coming from the peace process in the previous governments, the Teng Sen and Aung San Suu Kyi governments, focus on how to establish democratic federation for Myanmar. And because of this, the power of revolution, the power of people revolution against Min Ong Lai is so powerful because it's combined what democratizing process and federalizing process. So it is the miscalculation by Min Ong Lai and Min Ong Lai is now in a rather difficult situation. But I think Min Ong Lai will not give up uh, very soon because uh, he and his colleague, General So Win, has a political roadmap for Myanmar because they need to wait and see the appropriate time frame uh, for having the general election and then reproduce Discipline democracy, like mm. the from 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 Tan Choi in the past, the hybrid political regime again, and and uh, in the way that democratic uh, uh, political parties cannot dominate the parliamentary structure. Mm. So 
it, it would be the coalition government, the combination between military political parties and alliance, such as political party by ethnic armed groups to establish coalition government under hybrid political regime. That is political roadmap by Min Ong Lai. But in reality, I think it is rather difficult to accomplish now. So that's the official roadmap that they put out, that they officially say that's what we want. Or is yes. that your analysis of what they try to do? Official, officially, officially. So in that sense, like act the a glimmer of hope is that even the military junta knows that they have to go back to some sort of hybrid like government structure with the current enemies. That's actually accepted dogma at the moment. We have to bring these enemies back into a, a civil uh, administration. Is that the goal? Yeah, I, I think uh, some people also try to propose this political formula for having a, a coalition government uh, with political adversaries for power sharing. Uh, there might be representative from NUG government, from ethnic armed organization, and uh, uh, Myanmar military government to, to sit together for uh, for power sharing. Uh, but in reality, I think it, it, it it is so difficult at this moment because now Myanmar is a, in a critical juncture for uh, the civil war. The opposition group uh, has gained benefit because they can suppress Myanmar military in many battlefields along the frontier, along the borderline. So they, they want to try its best to, to, to convince Myanmar military to negotiate. But, but in the position that uh, uh, the opposition group can the upper hand, okay? So they, they, they don't want to give up their military campaign now. So I, I think the fighting, the sporadic fighting or the military fighting uh, still remain. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit that I think uh, if we employ the game theoretical model in political science, uh, we can produce a more systematic uh, 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 scenarios about Myanmar after the coup because the Myanmar military can be classified in three actions regarding to the civil war with opposition group. The first one is uh, they might try to accommodate fully or reduce their original political demand as much as possible because uh, they they has a lot of disadvantage uh, comparing to opposition group. Uh, but another action is they would try its best to subjugate and suppress uh, the opposition group. No need for political negotiation. They, they, they want to fight as much as possible. But that would be the middle way that is sometimes Myanmar military want to negotiate, but sometimes want to fight. So you can see fighting along with the peace process. So there, there might be three actions from Myanmar military. And for opposition group, uh, NUG government with some ethnic armed organizations, their action can be classified into three ways as well. Uh, fully accommodation, partly accommodation, and uh, fighting fully with Myanmar military and the combination between three actions by Myanmar military and three actions by opposition group can constitute the nine potential scenarios mm. for Myanmar politics. Yeah. Uh, in this sense, like the fighting in Myanmar is clearly utterly all in in um, for political purposes, right? And most of these political purposes, as far as I understand you now, are internal, although external actors also in, interact with them. But the main the main issue is the the actual power sharing outcome of future Myanmar. So right now, what we are seeing is is violence for the future of the Myanmar state um, and that's going to be det detrimental for that more than the 10 years the the peaceful 10 years previously yes yes I I think a uh, power challenge is quite crucial for resolving conflict in Myanmar mm -hmm. and the model of federalism can be applicable to Myanmar case but the situation in Myanmar today uh, is is uh, much more complicated than the past uh, because nowadays some ethnic armies 
especially Arakan Army in the southwestern Myanmar, uh, has already proclaimed officially that federalist structure might not be applicable to uh, Rakhine or Arakanist state, and they they prefer to establish confederalism for mm -hmm. people. And uh, in a theoretical framework, federalism and confederalism is not the same thing, right? Uh, so when talking about confederalism, it means that subnational government or constituent units should have more power than central or federal government. But uh, for talking about uh, federalist structure, the power challenge should be equal in one way or another. Uh, so the concept of confederalism uh, uh, is uh, uh, now uh, proposed by political leaders from Arakan army. Uh, so if we conclude that the concept of feder federalism is sufficient for resolving conflict in Myanmar, I think it might not for today because there, there is another concept, confederalism. And Myanmar military, yes, they also accept uh, uh, the concept of federalism in some way, but in deep feeling, they still prefer to have unitarianism. Yeah, uh, but in, in Myanmar. last question, but it's interesting. So these Arakan state didn't didn't propose to secede. It's, it's, it, it proposes confederalism. Uh, and nobody, nobody proposes to like join another state, right? They, nobody really wants to go. I mean, nobody jo proposes to join uh, Thailand, for instance. That's something that just hasn't come up, I suppose, right? Yeah, uh, Arakan army has already proclaimed to establish confederalism, uh, but mm. in but in the deep feeling, I I think. But why uh, not? Why not independence? Why not secede? Why confederalism? I think uh, for for the first step, confederalist structure would be acceptable by by other political stakeholders in Myanmar. But in the long run, they might proclaim the full independence separated from the Union of Myanmar. Mm. Okay, uh, but uh, ap apart from Arakan Army case, I think uh, there are other cases that should be taken into account. For example, in Northern Char State, uh, there are ethnic armies such as the Gokang and the Palong group. Uh, nowadays, they can command and control uh, a lot of uh, uh, territorial domains, and they try to establish the Palong State in the near future. But, but the Palong State is quite unique uh, because uh, it, 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 is, it is not in Federalist or confederalist structure. I'm not sure about this, but it should be the autonomous region. Mm. But the territorial domain should be larger or bigger than the territorial domain uh, currently by 2008 constitution because of uh, they they obtain a lot of benefits by waiting war last year, and they. Uh, 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 had more control over land and trade rules. So their state building project uh, is so powerful nowadays. And another group is RCSS or Resolution Council of Chan State, uh, which has the code connection with the Thai government, the Thai security sector. And as you already mentioned that uh, the, the population of RCSS, uh, the mass movement under RCSS is ethnic Thai people which has similar language, similar culture and identity with the Thai people, especially in the northern part of Thailand. Uh, so according to my, my own survey, there are some representatives from RCSS talking about how to uh, cooperate closely uh, with the Thailand and how to incorporate the southern Chan state with the northern part of Thailand. Oh, mm. it is for the Thai people. And uh, the last one is uh, the, the Kajin state, uh, very close to the western part of Thailand, especially the Tak province. Uh, uh, before, uh, uh, since the Cold War period, there was political movement by Kalen, uh, political elites, talking about the establishment of Gautule state. Gautule state is the greater state, meaning that the Kalen nationalist movement want to incorporate other territories inhabited largely by Kalen people beyond the Kalen day Kalen or Kajin state. And, and they want to incorporate uh, this land, for example, Tong U, 
in central Myanmar, uh, Pegu in central Myanmar, and uh, other domain inhabited by the Burman people and the Mon people, and incorporated and established at the new greater state called Gautule, and that would be independent state separating from Myanmar. So I, I think Myanmar military uh, uh, ha has no trust about KNU or Kalen nationalist people because in the past they used to uh, proclaim or a campaign about how to establish the Gautule state as an independent state from Myanmar. So political imagination uh, from ethnic minority uh, groups uh, uh, is quite diverse. It is a very complicated situation, but you helped me to understand this a little bit better as for now. And I think we will have to talk again, especially if something starts happening in Myanmar, because at the moment it's still it's still relatively just, just boiling. But historically speaking, at some point, something something big might change. I would like to thank you very much, uh, Dulya Pak uh, Prechalat, for your time today. Thank you so much. And I do hope that we have a fruitful conversation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>